if you did not finish, it's okay, it's still early on. Um, but if you did finish and you looked up and you're done with 35, okay, let's give them like five more minutes, which the good thing is you're worried about tired, I won't have it in me. Um, you know, it gives you a little bit of chance to, to kind of recoup and whatnot. The big thing going into a uh, multiple choice um, is you shouldn't be afraid of it. I think early on people kind of get scared of it. I'm not going to answer the questions and whatnot. If you read the passage and you follow along, it kind of takes care of itself. Now, some of the passage are, passages are going to be a little bit more difficult, um, but if you at least understand, if I can get, if I can understand what it is that I'm reading, chances of getting the questions right are, are certainly going to go up. Um, Who's Ellen Terry? Chances are you never heard of her before reading the passage. Now you know about 50 some lines about her. What's one thing we know about her? Okay. Um, any idea like what kind of actress? So far as like film, TV, theater, stage. Pretend it says actress. There we go. Um, and yeah, she's primarily a stage actress. Uh, late 1800s is her heyday into the early 20th century. She does a little bit of stuff with film later on in life, but she's the preeminent Shakespearean female actress of, of her time period. She's she's an official dame in Great Britain. You get knighted, you know, sir. She got damed. What else do we know about her? Based on context, not really going to know personal history or, or things. You said unconfident? Okay. So, lacks confidence with writing skills. What's the narrator think about her writing skills? That she is talented? All right, so narrator's going talented. If you understand that she's an actress, ideally stage, narrator thinks she's a good writer, but she herself, Ellen Terry, doubts her abilities, you're probably in pretty good shape moving forward. There's certainly going to be some other elements, but those would be main parts that you would be able to pick up from it, um, and it should kind of help you with the question. So starting off with the very first one, which of the following statements is best supported by information given in the passage? What are we thinking? It's the Aiden Show. Go in D, D. No, I didn't ask what your grade is. What answer do you want? You can only ask that to so few people. And Olaf's not one of them. Oh, now you're switching your answer. Go into A. Your grade or the answer? Is it D? Now I'm confused. You're confusing me. Olaf, you're going D as well. Annie, did you go D? No. What would you put? A. For what? It's not Why? So this is the key thing for you as to why it's going to be D now? Okay. All right. You're right. It's D. And if it would be, fine. Um, but Annie mentioned the big thing. Now that we talked about this whole lacking confidence, that is something that's kind of bringing me over to D. If you get the question wrong, there's not an issue with it. It's fine. If you get the question wrong, we mention what the answer is, and you're still going, I'm not getting it. That's then when we certainly would have some kind of issue. Um, and we'll certainly kind of get into parts where you can kind of see where she would have lacked confidence in her skills, if that's still an area that could be a little bit of, uh, of trouble for you. Um, how about number two? Author's attitude toward Terry can best be described as, what did Rebecca do? You want C? I was looking at the wrong answer. That would have really confused me. Sympathetic and admiring. That's how you feel towards your blister. Sympathetic. No. Not admiring of it. Curious and skeptical. Will it come back? Pretty passionate about a lot of odd things. Yep, C. Two for two? Feels good. When you're two for ten, then you're like, oh. 
Um, line number one, and now we are going to have a fair number of questions that are dealing really with the first part of the passage. Line number one tells us that it is functioning as a metaphor for published text of the play, audience impression, critical reviews, plays in which actors in the company have performed previously, or stage designer sketches of sets. Um, it is the fate of actors to leave only picture postcards behind them. Every night when the curtain goes down, the beautiful color canvas is rubbed out. What remains is at best only a wavering, insubstantial phantom, got a phantom again just like yesterday, and a verbal life on the lips of the living. Um, take note of some of the words that are kind of getting used. Obviously picture postcards, but they are left behind them. They leave them. Um, every night when the curtain goes down, the canvas is rubbed out. What remains is at best only a phantom, a verbal life on the lips of the living. Um, what are the picture postcards? Okay. And you look like you're moving audience impressions. Um, wh why? You don't have to tell us that. What if it's wrong? Maybe. What would make stage acting so different from TV or film? I mean, there's certainly a lot of things, um, but what would be like some main? So it would be an unusual occurrence for, for that to kind of happen. For a redo. Mistake happens. Let's do it over. And the audience certainly isn't going to know about it. Mm -hmm. Just like whether you want it to be or not, there are certainly going to be differences with it. And I mean, directors and cast members know this all the time. That wasn't supposed to happen. Shh, it's okay. Audience will never know that kind of stuff. Abby? Um, with like TV shows and movies, like, there's so many lines here that you don't like it, but I don't really like it. Like, you're sitting in the audience with no idea of what's going on. Or you can hear the reaction or not hear the reaction that you want. And, and, yeah, and, and certainly a lot of actors become, stage actors, actresses become famous for their portrayal of certain people where they kind of like own that character. Um, but yeah, the curtain goes down. Um, you know, what remains is that insubstantial phantom, that verbal life on the lips of the living. It's certainly a temporary kind of thing, which was getting mentioned. This is written in 1940, so it's before the TV heyday and all that kind of stuff. So if it's the fate... You know, this is what the actor is going to be remembered for. Um, what will they be remembered for, essentially? It's going to come down to, what do we say? B. B. Audiences, impressions, basically how they remember that performance to be. Now, building off of this, the passage implies that the primary enemy of that beautiful colored canvas, that postcard that's being left, what's going to be the enemy of the audience's perception, it's going to be that passage of time. As you get older, you don't remember it maybe as well. Things get a little fuzzy, a little hazy. Eventually, your audience dies. Did you ever see Aiden Kelly on stage? Thank goodness I did not. Nope. Me neither. It's gone. And it's not going to be on videotape or for something like that. You take a look at number five. Yeah. The answer I did was A. Yeah, the day with the name and that one person made the system. Right. Yeah, that one's A. And so a person made the comment like earlier. So if you missed that whole passage of time thing, did that basically screw you on those questions? Yes. 
um, if you pick up on it early on, it helps you where you get that domino effect where, you know, you talk about you have three, you have like a minute per question. It's not going to take you three minutes to answer questions three, four, and five if you understand the relationship that amongst about, among them, you can knock those three out in probably like 45 seconds. You also, as you start to feel confidence in recognizing that, hey, there are some things that are linking it together, if we know that you can locate the correct answer, you don't have to do the process of elimination and go, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I think I'll go with that one. If you have confidence in your understanding of the passage, you know it's the right answer. You move on. You don't even worry about what those other options would be. It becomes a little bit more of a concern when you put, like, you know, I'm not calling anyone out, don't know if anyone did this, where a person will put A for five, um, and then you put, like, B for number four. There's not really that relationship. That's when we have a little sit down and go, okay, Darby, were you guessing? Was it 50-50 on one? Not sure for the other. But the hope would be you kind of start to see that link with three, four, and five occur. It's because you highlighted. That was karma. Um... Number six, you're still dealing with that same area, but now it's a different type of question, more of how do these sentences function with one another, what is the effect? So the first statement, um, first sentence, line one to two, it's the picture postcards, and then number two, uh, lines two to five, talking about um, you know that canvas being rubbed out, the only thing that's left is the wavering, insubstantial phantom, verbal life on the lips of the living. What do those second two sentences, sentences number two and three, do to the first, so far as like a structural type thing? Yeah. Ellie? You're going clarify and expand. You're going clarify and expand. Yeah, the answer's going to be clarify and expand. Number seven, here's my suggestion for pronoun antecedent questions. A lot of times people don't like them. I think in, parti in partiality, because of all the um, line numbers that you see, it becomes overwhelming. I wouldn't even look at the answers at first. Find the pronoun in line six, in this case it. Go to the passage, see if you can just figure out what it, the pronoun, would refer back to. If the answer you come up with is one of those five, feel confident enough in yourself, choose it, move on. Um, I think it becomes a little overwhelming if you start looking at what all those options are, and then people kind of forget what that whole task is. So we're taking a look at it here in line six. It is the fate of the actors to leave only picture postcards behind them. Every night when the curtain goes down, the beautiful colored canvas is rubbed out. What remains is at best only a wavering, insubstantial phantom, a verbal life on the lips of the living. Ellen Terry was well aware of it. My guess is a lot of folks narrowed it down to two, or we'll get two popular choices. I'm thinking one of those choices, Annie, fate. That's one I was thinking, and I'm thinking there might be another one. Phantom for D, you thinking Phantom for D? I'm thinking these are the two that people had to end up kind of deciding between. What do we think? You going A since you said A the first time? Yeah. Okay, you're going fake. Callie's going fake. Rebecca going Phantom? Yeah. Fate. Going fake. It is the fate of actors to leave only picture postcards behind them. Every night when the curtain goes down, the beautiful colored canvas is rubbed out. What remains at best is only a wavering, insubstantial phantom, the verbal life. She's well aware of it. There's the phantom. There's the overarching fate as the main idea. That is the one that she is aware of. The fate, the memory. Boy, like fist pumps are taking place here. And Kelly's dancing. Yes! Line 13. Nothing, nothing. She dropped her pen in, take note, we got despair. Oh, God, that I were a writer, she cried. Surely a writer could not string words together about Henry Irving's Hamlet and say nothing, 
nothing. It never struck her, humble as she was, obsessed by her lack of book learning, that she was, among other things, a writer. Why say something twice with emphasis? To emphasize. To emphasize wow. what? Her sense of frustration. Okay. Why did Kurt say the horror? The horror? Emphasize With what? We're not exactly <laughs> sure since we never know what it was. But, yep. Um, lack of frustration, not lack of frustration, lack of confidence, sense of frustration with her overall writing. That part there is one of the main clues that would help you with number one, letting us know she lacked that confidence because she didn't realize that she could write. Words bubbled off. Peeled off, used to describe the way she wrote. We also have emphasize again. What was this time, Ellie? I would say of her. Okay. Of her words, that even though she doesn't feel confident in them, she's able to come up with them without much thought, without a whole lot of uh, concern, issues, but she just doesn't realize it. Which of the following stylistic features is used most extensively in lines 25 to 30? This is one we want to get. B, 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 B. Could be. The effect of mentioning an academy portrait. Down line 32. When it does get mentioned, take note of some words by it. Um, with her pen, then at odds, at the ends of time, she has painted a self-portrait. It is not an academy portrait. So if it's not a portrait, it is probably then going to do what? Why C? Contrast. It's not an academy portrait, so you're clarifying the informal nature of her self-portrait through contrast. This, the sketches, D, um, the sketches that get mentioned talks about like arm, nose, you know, different parts of body. Keep in mind, these are more writing things that are taking place, so it's not an image. Pardon? Thirteen? Seven out of thirteen, eight out of thirteen would be a three, a nine out of thirteen would be a four, a ten or higher would be a five. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.